Welcome back to Camaraderie, a channel where I try to figure out old cameras and everything involved in the analog photography process and where my hair does whatever it wants, I am subject to its whims. Today, I've got a camera that is quite old. I know everything on this channel is pretty much old. Second oldest camera that I've talked about on this channel, uh, it's the Diax 1A DX. I'm gonna go with Diax. Diax was a, a line of cameras produced by uh, this German guy, Walter Voss. He made a company. The company was called, and I, I can read the letters, but it's German, so I'm not even gonna try. I do a really terrible fake German accent, I'm not gonna do that. So <laughs> I'm just gonna read it like it looks. It's the Walter Voss Photo Camera Fabrication and Fine Mechanic. It's a, that's a mouthful of a company name. Stick to something else, man. Just call it Walter Voss, which actually, that's pretty much what they ended up doing. The Diax 1A is a viewfinder camera. It's, uh, so, so there's nothing like automatic or anything about it. Um, it's not a rangefinder, even though it looks like one. We'll get to that in a second. The Diax 1A was made in uh, 1952. The company was in production from 1947 to 1957. So right after the World War, uh, the, the second one, from what I understand, Walter Voss was pretty much just trying to put German optics and German engineering back on the map. Um, as far as camera making goes. I mean, he did have some competition, you know, Zeiss and Leica and all that. Uh, but, all that aside, let's, uh, let's get to the camera. Um, oh, fun fact. Walter Voss photo camera fabrication and fine mechanic was based in uh, Ulm, Germany, which is the birthplace of one Albert Einstein. So this Diax was uh, gifted to me a number of years ago, and I finally have gotten around to thinking about it again. It came in a lovely leather case. It's embossed. So you open the case, and it's got a nice crushed blue velvety interior. It's got a lens cap, and a uh, mine came with a, a UV filter. So that's pretty cool. Probably won't be using that um, while I'm shooting just because I don't know the quality of it. I don't want any weird flares or anything going on. It is uh, locked into the case right here. You just unscrew it and she's ready to go. So the first thing that you might notice or at least that I noticed about it is that it looks cool. So the um, Diax 1A, kind of looking at it first off, these three viewfinder windows um, are pretty cool. They look cool, at least. Um, I wish one of them was a viewfinder, but this is not a, um, <laughs> a viewfinder. I wish at least one of them was a viewfinder. Turns out all three are. There's one uh, viewfinder window for um, three different focal lengths. This is the first Diax camera that Ultra Voss made with um, interchangeable lenses. Since it's not an SLR, it's um, a viewfinder, so they, since it is an interchangeable lens viewfinder system, they put three viewfinders in there for whatever focal length lens you might have, uh, which is pretty cool. It's quite considerate of them. Right, so this lens, again, I'm not even gonna try and uh, say the name, just because I don't want to butcher it. Uh, actually, I am going to try it. It's the Schneider Kreuznach Zinar <laughs> lens. Uh, this one in particular uh, has a minimum f-stop of, or I guess a maximum aperture of uh, 2.8, and it's a 45 millimeter lens. So, um, I will be looking through this first viewfinder right here for the time that I'm shooting with this. So from front to back on the lens itself, this is a hefty looking little lens. Um, 
It's uh, got quite a bit of weight to it. So this front ring is going to be your f-stop, your aperture ring, um, which is kind of, to me, that's kind of backwards, uh, just because I'm used to focusing on, I'm used to focusing with a front ring rather than changing the aperture, but it kind of got it flipped around a little bit. Um, so this next ring back is going to be your focus ring. Behind that, this is actually the ring where you can take off the lens like that. And this is, this is, if this wasn't anything else, this would be a fantastic paperweight. Um, cause it's weighty. Let's see, this is honestly, I don't want to say half of the camera's weight, but probably about a third of the camera's weight. You can see it's a, it's going to be a leaf, it's a leaf shutter design. So you now that's, you know, what makes you able to change the lenses, um, while you're shooting film. Uh, you know, you don't have to wait till you're done with a roll and don't have any film in it, uh, before you change the lenses. So yeah, let's, uh, keep moving on. We got what you have to do to put the lens on is this little notch right there. You're going to fit over, uh, what looks like kind of an odd looking screw, <laughs> kind of like me. Yeah, so then you just screw it back on like that and you see the little Diax sign, Diax logo right there. Moving back, this is the shutter speed select, which I find a bit odd that it's not different because kind of like the Argus C3, there is no dedicated, there's no dedicated stop um, for the shutter speeds. You just kind of get it close to where you want it and you're ready to go. But I can already tell this is going to be a pain to change the shutter speed just because it's right on the body or right, right on the barrel. It's really hard to, it's just not a convenient way of changing shutter speed. Got everything from a bulb setting all the way up to, all the way up to a 500th of a second. So, um, not the fastest shutter speed mobility. It's all right though. I mean, we do get all the way up to an f-stop of 16 on here. So, eh, unless you're shooting really, really bright scenes, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be just fine. Um, let's see, moving back, let's see, let's examine all these other little dials and switches and stuff. Um, down here, we've got, uh, this is your flash setting, this little green thing. Um, so it's, that's nice. It's a nice clicky, clicky little bit. I love clicky bits. See, the X is gonna be for um, an electronic flash, and then the M is going to be for flash synchronization. Uh, I don't use flash, so I'm not even going to worry about that uh, for the rest of this video. All right, on the bottom here, we've got um, two circles, three circles, two of which don't appear to have any real purpose. Um, right here, this little dial is where you unlock the back of the camera. You can slide it off, and that takes us to the inside of the camera. The back plate, pretty, pretty simple. It's uh, got a pressure plate, and that's about it. And it's just there to keep everything light tight. So uh, we'll see, see how it does in that regard uh, later on. On the left, you've got your film chamber. Yeah, you just shove it in there. There's nothing that pops up or anything. You just put the put the roll in there and move it across. And it's um, kind of a really simple design for how it gets the film on the take-up spool. You just literally got to manhandle it into there. And um, yeah, you can see right there. Yeah, you just kind of slide it where it's bent up. At first I thought that was a mistake or a manufacturing error or something, but no, it's actually supposed to be like that. You just slide it slide it in there, make sure it's on the sprocket and you're good to go. 
moving back, moving along here a little bit. Um, All right. So, yeah, no, sorry to interrupt my beautiful B-roll, but while I was shooting the loading process, um, the shutter got stuck open. And this film advance knob won't turn, so yeah, I don't, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad I already shot with this, but whatever. So I'm just gonna act like this didn't happen and shoot the rest of my B-roll. You got here the three different viewfinders, one for around a 45 to 50 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and 90 millimeter. And they are color coded uh, for your um, gazing convenience. So if you're looking through and you see it's clear, you know you're on your 45 to 50. Blue is gonna be 35 millimeter and yellowish tint is gonna be your 90 millimeter. You know, I mean, you can tell from the magnification in the viewfinder which one you're looking through, but you know, it, what, I guess they gotta help you out how they can. Try and make it easy enough for you um, so you don't get super confused. Pop this back on here, so. It's gotta be on Z, or it's gotta be on A for open and Z for locked, I guess. And on the top, moving right along, um, we got the back of the camera with the company logo and made in Germany printed in, um, just so you don't forget. And up top we've, uh, or on the, on the sides here, we've got uh, two little eyelets for a camera strap. I uh, don't have one that fits this style of camera strap, so I'm gonna be freehanding it today. Um, let's see, on the right, we've got the Film Advance uh, winder. And so that's the Film Advance knob, so that's cool. Um, it's nice and nice and textured. It's got a really nice uh, grippy texture here, which I'm sure you might be, able to, might be able to tell from the camera, but nice little spiral design. It's all little bits of flourish like that that I really appreciate. And actually below the film wind knob, um, we've got a little dial for your film counter. And how it works is it doesn't reset or anything whenever you open the back. You do have to do that. You have to set it to zero manually every time you um, load a new roll of film. How it works is, you know, if you get it all set in there, turn your film to the next, uh, till it stops turning and then you're on mark one and you just works like that for the rest of the roll. It's pretty cool. Uh, I got your shutter button right here, your shutter release. And you can actually see, it's pretty cool how um, some of the mechanics of this thing work just because this is from what I can tell the actual shutter release right here and you just plunge this button down and that um, that snaps the shutter so that's pretty cool and something kind of similar like that or similar to that is um, with the winding of the film advanced knob this little piece of metal pushes this all the way back and you're ready to shoot. If you do that again, and then um, just push this along here, that's uh, that's your self timer. So yeah, it's pretty neat. Cool. Cold shoe up here. Uh, there's no batteries in this thing, so it's not a hot shoe. It's just a accessory mount. Um, from what I understand, you could get a rangefinder um, accessory mount <laughs> uh, to put on this thing. And uh, that would let you actually know kind of what you're focusing on. Um, with these viewfinders, there is no parallax line. There is no focusing. I thought it was a rangefinder at first. It is not a rangefinder. It's just a viewfinder camera. Um, so focusing might be a little bit of a problem. Um, but you can fix that with their handy dandy rangefinder accessory. And then finally, you've got your film rewind knob, which also acts as a film stock reminder. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what all of these are. I can't believe that they only had ASA 80 
film back then, but... In fact, I know they didn't, but whatever. And, uh, yeah, <clears throat> from what I can tell, that's pretty much the rundown of this camera. So I'm going to load it up real quick and go shoot with it and see what it, see what happens. I'm, I'm excited about this. This thing looks cool. It's uh, It's got a nice hefty weight to it. And, yeah, I think... I did some uh, did some research on the lens maker, um, and they actually are still in business and still doing awesome things. They're kind of on the level or like around the level of Zeiss, which to me is pretty wild. Just because uh, like Zeiss lenses are like the holy grail of um, lenses, and they Schneider actually won an Oscar recently for I think like technical achievement or something like that with one of their cinema lenses. So yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna load this up real quick and take it on out and see what we get. So I've got everything scanned, uh, well developed, scanned, loaded into Lightroom, and uh, yeah, let's take a look at what we got. You might notice this little bit at the top right, um, and it's in pretty much, yeah, it's in just about all the pictures. Um, down here, up here, this is... I'll show you guys once uh, once we're done talking about the pictures and the quality of the lens and everything. I'll show you what actually happened here, but basically, real quick, is um, it just the the camera just doesn't capture <laughs> the pictures right on the negative. First thing I want to talk about is the offset nature of uh, the pictures. I expected this to an extent, but it's quite uh, quite a bit more drastic than what I had anticipated as far as um, looking through the viewfinder and what the picture, what the lens is actually capturing. I expected some offset just because it's a viewfinder camera, there's no through the lens, you don't see what you're getting. And that's how it is with all viewfinder and rangefinder cameras. Um, but... Uh, you know, just because the what you're looking through, the window you're looking through is over to the left, and the lens is more, you know, actually in the middle of the camera. So there's some offset to be expected, but that's why people make parallax lines. Obviously, Diax doesn't. At least not with the 1A it, are there any sort of parallax lines. And, um, yeah, that's that's fine, I guess. With the way that this camera is set up with the viewfinder on the left um, and the lens firmly in the middle, uh, I was expecting some amount of offset, but not this much just because uh, the, the viewfinder, uh, this uh, I guess AC unit that's kind of boarded into this brick wall is, um, it was in the center of the, of the viewfinder. The outside of the frame was about kind of right here. I was not expecting at all to see this um, sign right there. I didn't want it in my frame. That's why I didn't include it uh, in what I was looking at with the camera. But I was expecting maybe offsets, uh, the 
yeah, I mean, I knew it'd be offset just because that's that's how it works. But like, I was expecting maybe out to maybe out to like right here. Um, so that was pretty disappointing. So I mean, now that I know that, I can if I were to shoot with this camera again, I could uh, compensate for that. But that's just another thing that I don't want to have to think about. I am pretty pleased with, um, for the most part, the focusing ability of the camera, just because, I mean, I, I was kind of helped out by it being super sunny outside, so, you know, just throw it on an F-16 and, uh, you know, hope for the best. Um, that's going to give you so much focus range, um, as opposed to, you know, shooting wide open at 2.8. Um, so yeah, let's, let's see here. Let's kind of go through the rest of, or not the rest of the pictures, just some pictures I thought were interesting. Yeah, always a big fan of, you know, down the, down the alley shots. And this, uh, hmm, you yeah, can't really see, I haven't done any adjustments to this. I might be able to pull a little bit of this out, but um again it it's uh you know it's f16 you pretty much got just about everything in focus so i was you know not always my preferred method of shooting but you know it is fine i suppose uh this one i thought was pretty interesting just because i had never seen burglar alarm on a building i would really like to see that go off <laughs> at some point I don't think it's actually a bank anymore, but um, actually, in fact, I know it's not. It's a chamber of commerce, but still just a cool looking little old design thing that I've never seen before. So, um, and this is just a small, it's a downtown of a small town um, close to where I live. So this picture, I was trying to get an idea of the shape of the bokeh um just because it is a pretty uh complex little lens and i just wanted to kind of get an idea of the shape of everything and that yeah you know you can kind of it's it's nice and swirly i do really enjoy that about this lens is it has that swirliness um and the stuff that's not out of focus it's just a nice little nice aesthetic it's not something i'm always going for but uh, yeah, it, it's kind of strange how everything kind of warps and meshes and um, does all that. So, and again, this uh, I did have to. I'm super overexposed right here in the highlights because I knew that I needed to open the aperture up quite a bit just to be able to get uh, some bokeh going on. Since this camera only has a maximum or quickest shutter speed of uh, 500th of a second. I uh, couldn't go up to like a thousand or, you know, even 2000 with that you can do with some cameras. Um, so I kind of just knew I was gonna be sacrificing any sort of detail in the highlights in order to try and get a sense of the shape and character of the bokeh um, that this lens has. I was also hoping to get uh, these leaves and these limbs in sharp, you know, crispy focus, but just because of the nature of, you know, what I've said before, you know, basically just guessing, guesstimating uh, the distance to these, uh, to anything that I'm shooting is uh, kind of a pain. I'm, I'm not used to operating like that uh, because I don't have to <laughs> most of the time. Uh, you can actually see what you're usually see what you're what I'm focusing on but um, yeah that is what it is wonder how many times I'll say that in this video I just took a picture of this because uh, it's a sign of the times ha, sign because it's it's a sign haha ha. um, I like old textured things so I've got some rusty door and an old uh, gas container of some sort and boxes. I just think it looked cool. I just think it had some character to it. So, um, again, you know, pretty much everything's in focus, um, except for like way out here. Honestly, even then you can still 
make out everything, but you know, it's just <sighs> it's just how it is with this camera. I didn't want this car right here. You know, it's supposed to cut off around right here. And this is probably my favorite picture out of the bunch. It's just got nice, crisp lines, nice detail in the shadows without losing anything in the highlights. It's just as far as, I mean, it's nothing amazing to look at, but it is um, <laughs> uh, te technically speaking the best quote unquote uh, picture that I took just because it you can see it. <laughs> it's all it's all there. There's no like super distracting elements. Uh, the composition is fine. Um, you know, you got your crispy crispy details, even in the shadows. Um, again, it could be a little bit actually no. I like the focus on here. It's it's nice. It's got a nice movement I guess um, in this in this picture it's it feels um, I don't know it, it, I, f I feel a way about it this is the last frame that I was able to get I took I thought probably about eight to ten more pictures uh, honestly that I think I'm gonna call it right here and uh, switch back to a uh, little, little talking head view. That was the last picture that I was able to get with uh, this camera because I got to the end of the roll without realizing it. So while I was winding uh, the film, advancing the film, I must have adjusted the um, frame counter somehow. So that meant that I didn't know how many frames I had left, how many shots I had left. And normally that wouldn't be an issue because I was, I, I realized it while I was shooting and I was like, all right, well, I'll just go until it stops advancing. This camera decided to, instead of not winding anymore, it just decided to tear holes and um, or like rip through the sprocket holes. And so that meant that I thought I was getting more shots than I actually was. So that's really frustrating. And the fact that it, instead of like pulling the film, you know, super tight to where you can tell that you can't wind it anymore, like a every other camera I've ever had, even the really dumb plastic ones that I've used, um, won't just keep winding at the end of the um, roll of film. But this one just decided to tear through the sprocket holes and throw off my film counter. And I am left with about five extra, or I don't know, honestly, probably about seven shots that I thought I was getting. So I eventually just decided to wind the whole thing back. Um, Cause I was like, maybe did it like somehow get off the sprockets and it's not been advancing. And do I only have like five frames or something that got exposed? Well, it turns out I shot the entire roll and just didn't no. Um, so yeah, that was a little bit disappointing. Um, when I pulled them out of, uh, the developing, when I, when I pulled them out of my Patterson tank to hang them up and dry them, I immediately saw that and I was like, oh no, uh, I'm missing like seven shots. Uh, so yeah, can't really give it any good marks. Can't really give the Diax 1A good marks. Um, for that, so, eh, ending impressions with this camera. It's nice to look at. It is, it is. It's not nice to shoot with it, though, at all. Would I recommend this camera for somebody who's getting into film photography, uh, or for any reason. No, don't get it. Unless you just want something that looks cool. 
it's a collector's piece through and through. The aperture and the shutter speed rings are backwards. The film negatives come out wonky because the way the inside of the camera is designed, it is just kind of off. The lens is way offset from the viewfinder. There's no focusing help or anything of that nature. Um, which, you know, sure, you just be be good and everything will come out right. But the shutter speed is hard to adjust. Um, if it doesn't even go that fast. So you can't like compensate for being in really bright sunny spots. Or if you want to pump up your shutter speed just so that you can bring the aperture down so that you can get some sort of depth of field, there's like, unless you're shooting in perfect conditions, this camera just doesn't cut it for me, man. Um, the knobs tear up my fingers, tears through the sprocket holes. Instead of just, you know, letting you know that your film is done, it just is like, no, nah, I'm just going to spin in place and tear out your sprocket holes. It's, it's super easy to trip the shutter when you don't mean to. Um, at least it is for me with my hands. Me and my hands. Ugh. It's way too easy to take your film counter off of what it's supposed to be. Um, there's zero help on focusing. It, it just makes me ask why? What? What was this guy thinking? Who designed this camera? I know it's a Walter Voss that made the Diax line, but like, seriously, man, have you never used a camera? Did you ever pick up a camera before you designed this? Did you do you like ripping the skin on your fingers to try and change the shutter speed? Are you just a masochist? Probably. I I don't know. This was like. A pet project gone wrong and I don't know how it made it to production they only made about a hundred thousand cameras in their 10-year period and honestly I'm happy about that um, I'm sure some later models might have had better features or layout or whatever but still for a camera that was trying to be like a poor man's Leica they fell way below the bar I don't know, they appeal to my sense of aesthetic with the gears and the dials and um, little flippy bits and knobs and such, but it's not a fun camera to use, and that is, I think, a super important factor. It's not that I want my cameras to be fun to shoot with, I don't, it's just that I don't want them to take the fun out of shooting, if that makes any sense. Like, I don't... I don't want to have to think about all these things and struggle with the controls. I uh, I don't want to have to triple check my focus and like try and put my arm out and like imagine in my head how many of me would fit in between where I am and what I'm shooting and kind of guess how much distance that is. Like how, how many arm lengths is it away? You know, I don't want to have to think about that. I just want to focus on shooting, man. And this camera just doesn't let me do that. And yeah, I just, I wanted to like this camera so much and I do really enjoy the lens. I like some of the characteristics of the lens. It comes so close to being a usable camera and it is usable, but like when the negatives don't even come out lined up with where they're supposed to be and I don't like my the inserts on my scanner are very particular like you have the very tiniest bit of wiggle room but this is just off of that so I can't even have the full thing that I shot it's just it's just a it's a frustrating camera to shoot with and if you want something from around this era that honestly works a lot better, look at the Argus C3. 
They're cheaper on today's market just because there were a lot more of them made and they're better, I guess. I don't know. The, I mean, the Argus C3 has a rangefinder in it and that was like made 10 years before this one was. It just, ugh. I just, I just don't like it, man. I just don't. Cameras should make it easier for you to take pictures. Because that's exactly what they're there for. I'm assuming this is for, like, the amateur enthusiast who can't afford a Leica, you know, back in the day. I mean, I still am an amateur enthusiast who can't afford a Leica. But you know what? Yeah, I wanted, I just wanted to like it. And I don't. I think that's pretty much the summary of this camera. It's just heavy and clunky and unpredictable and now that I know all of its faults yes I could uh, compensate for it but why would I do that I why why would I waste any more film on this camera and it's it's a shame the I'm <laughs> probably never shooting with this camera again well uh, that's it thanks for watching this episode of uh, Camaraderie. It's got a little bit of a different thing. Uh, I'm looking for the good in these cameras and this one just doesn't have much going on. If you're just a collector, you don't actually want to shoot with it, sure, pick one of these up. It's great. Because it looks funky and weird and cool. But it does not shoot well. I, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this camera. I'm done with this video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, subscribe, like, and share, and comment, and all that. Um, and yeah, um, we'll, I'll see you on the other side of whatever screen you're watching this on at some point in the very near future.